Welcome to today's Heart Lift with Janelle. Today, we are welcoming one of my favorite doctors, Dr. Benjamin Perkis, founder of the Aroma Freedom Technique. Dr. Benjamin Perkis is a clinical psychologist with over 25 years of experience, and he's an international speaker. He also found a way to integrate the power of scent with specific focusing techniques to create a unique approach to mental and emotional wellness. By using the principle of memory reconsolidation, he shows people and certifies practitioners, myself included, how to let go of negative thoughts, feelings, and memories that might be holding us back. Aroma Freedom Technique is an integrative healing modality that incorporates elements of EDMR, NET, polyvagal theory, somatic psychology, meditative awareness, trauma therapy, and aromatherapy in a unique, highly efficient, and effective way. Since the publication of his book in 2016, The Aroma Freedom Technique, thousands of people have discovered how to shift their mental state and mood quickly and gently, and to create the availability and the ability to take positive action. Training is now available through online video courses, and he does have, as I mentioned, a practitioner certification program, and I am one of his certified practitioners in aroma freedom technique and trauma memory resolution technique and aroma reset and aroma boost, and I am so thrilled to have Dr. Perkis with us today. Give him a warm welcome, Heartlifters. Sometimes the story we tell ourselves is not really true. Sometimes the story others tell about us is not really true. Here on today's Heartlift with Janelle, we are going to learn how to rewrite our story. So pick up your favorite pen and journal, grab a cup of something delicious, and start your heartlifting journey towards living a meaningful life. So Dr. Perkis, thank you so much for honoring us here in the Stronger Everyday community with your presence. We're so happy you're here. Happy to be here. Always enjoy speaking with you. <laughs> so happy. <sighs> I tell you what, so many of us in this community are trying to find our way home to our true essence, to our, like I like to say, our God-breathed self. I would love for you, if you would, honor us by sharing a little bit of your personal journey to finding your way to your essence. And I've heard you refer to yourself, Dr. Perkis, this way as a seeker. And I love that. And I know that your parents were divorced at nine, and that was um, a very, obviously a very big event in your life. I have many clients right there now, little ones, littles, littles who are there. And I think that so many, at least of my own clients and, and those in my community, we really underestimate. You cannot wrap your head around the affect, the A-F-F-E-C-T of traumatic, difficult childhood experiences. So can you just help us a little bit here to understand why such events like divorce or, um, you know, childhood trauma leave that kind of imprint on us, then sure. it reaches far into our adulthood. And I have people all the time going, no, wasn't a big deal. Just wasn't a big deal. Help. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I guess the first thing I'll say is that whatever Whatever happens to us in childhood is what we think happens in the world. Mm. So right. grow up, family, parents are divorced. You think that's what happens because that's what happened to you. And you don't have the ability to uh, compare with everyone else in the world, or maybe you are comparing with others. But so in my case, let's say parents got divorced. And now in my case, they weren't fighting with each other. It wasn't particularly, it wasn't violent or vicious, or there was mm. an abuse or anything like that. So I didn't grow up with any beliefs about that sort of thing being normal in the world, but mm -hmm. I did grow up with the belief that, you know, you're kind of on your own because, uh -huh. you know, okay, mom's working now, you know, mom's, 
she was actually going to get her PhD. Um, wow. She went back to school when they got divorced. And so my, I guess we were, I guess you call us latchkey kids at that yes. time, you know, which it didn't seem like that big of a deal at the time, because that's just what was happening in our family. And it wasn't until much later that I got a sense of what it might be like to not have that growing up, you know, to have more of a sense of, um, you know, of a home and family, maybe that would look a little different. So for instance, because that was my experience, I developed an attitude of got to do things myself, mm-hmm. which again, it's up could, to be me. Worse. <laughs> could be worse. And, and an empowered version of that is I'm going to be a seeker, take control of my life and take myself where I need to go. So I turned that into kind of a healthy, healthy version of that. But you could also imagine someone going down a different path and going mm-hmm. down more of a victimhood path and say, oh, you know, I, I'm alone. Nobody loves me. And uh, I can never be connected with others. I mean, in my case, um, although I developed this very independent streak, um, if there has been a downside of it, I guess it, you could say it has to do with maybe feeling like I found a tribe that I belong to. You know, that's been, you know, I have my, my friends few and far between that I, that I love and rely on, but not a general sense of, hey, I can just get along with all the neighbors and we all enjoy the same stuff. I don't have that feeling in life as much. Right. You know, so I guess I'll say that's just my case, but let's take someone who, let's say they were had physical abuse or sexual abuse mm-hmm. or something like that. First of all, they're going to develop beliefs about themselves. What's mm-hmm. wrong with me? What did I do to deserve this? Uh, also, they'll develop beliefs about the world. You know, the world is dangerous. The world is unsafe. Mm-hmm. Uh, or beliefs about men or women or anything like that. And these beliefs kind of, that's like the architecture of our personality that, that forms right. the, the beliefs that we carry going into the world, into our relationships and so on. So even people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, any age really, mm-hmm. you know, are going to be living out those beliefs for yeah. better or worse, wherever that leads them. And it's really when they come into therapy, they come into some sort of treatment, they start reflecting and they realize you know, is there another way? And uh, that's the work that you and I do really gets into helping people follow that bridge from where they are to where they want to go. Oh, I love that. I love that crossing the bridge. Bridges are so, so huge and big in my area, living on the East coast where the Atlantic ocean is, I can't go anywhere without crossing a bridge, Yep. you know, and they are connectors. That's what they do. They connect us from one place to another. And so How then did your seeker heart, your seeker mind and soul and body lead you to uh, developing and curating this amazing approach that I herald all the time, aroma freedom technique? That's a big leap, but I kind of want to take that leap. Uh, And maybe there were some bridges along the way that you crossed that ended, you ended up mixing these oils and applying them <laughs> to neuroplasticity. <laughs> well, it was a long journey. And, and uh, if you want, I'll tell you the long or the short version, but. Oh, just give uh, it to us. I want to hear I, it. I grew up. So when I was a kid, so I grew up, my parents were divorced. So I lived with my mom. She was a scientist. So oh. I was a scientist. So she, you know, she was a molecular biologist. So I got into computers. I was a computer programmer and my first year of college was computer engineering. Mm. And, uh, after a year of that, I realized uh, life is bigger than that for me. You know, I didn't want to just be so pigeonholed. So I transferred, I shifted majors. I, then I shifted more into my dad was an English professor. So then I started, Oh my gosh, I started taking creative writing classes and then I majored in anthropology and uh, philosophy is actually what I got my undergraduate in. And then I'm like, Hmm, what am I going to do with that? All I could do is teach philosophy at some college and then be kind of I, w- I felt like I'd be trapped within that whole publisher parish thing. And so some of my friends were into psychology. Well, hey, you could do this as a way to kind of continue this quest for, for knowledge and learning, self-knowledge and understanding in a way that kind of keeps you grounded with others and you can be your own boss. So I said, okay, sounds good. So I went like to that. right. So I went to Duquesne University, which was a existential phenomenological psychology, very humanistic. And I studied all the different modalities, my internship. In Ottawa, I was studying 
everything from behaviorism to psychodynamic to Jungian, experiential, gestalt, family, mm-hmm. systemic, all, all the different modalities, because I knew that no one of them held the truth to everything. So oh. little did I know, but I was kind of like gathering pieces all mm-hmm. along the way. I was gathering little pieces, uh, body centered. I learned some from that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, and then I got my, got my degree and I started practicing. It's funny. I was about a week into my practice. I said, "Uh Oh, I think I need some more training. I realized yes. welcome to yeah. the world of psychology. And yeah. when you're counseling. in there, when you're in there with people all the time. So then I got EMDR training and that opened up a whole world trauma training. And I realized I needed to go deeper into the brain and into the body and the neurology of people that just talking about stuff wasn't sufficient. So Mm. I was gathering all these times is gathering all of these pieces together. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then, you know, right along the way with everything, my wife and I, we had started, we were introduced to essential oils. We went to a young living essential oils class and we loved them. And at that time we were just learning how to apply them to people's backs and spines and feet. Mm-hmm. And we would teach classes and using them for digestion or using them for headaches, you know? So I kind of felt like I was living these two worlds. I had my psychology world, which I right. loved. Mm -hmm. And I had my essential oils world, which I also love, but Mm -hmm. they weren't really coming together. And so you could say that final bridge was when I, when I realized that, um, actually it was a mentor of mine. Um, I was explaining this too, and she paused for a minute and she said, create a tool. If you create a tool, then others can do what you do because the (sighs) whole thing with our essential oils business was about teaching others to do for themselves so that we wouldn't have to keep fixing them, that we can empower them to do it for themselves. So of course, in psychology, we run into the same problem. People come in month after month, year after year. And if, if they just rely on us to help them, well, Mm -hmm. how good is that? I mean, you could Mm -hmm. say it's good for our practice, but it's not Mm -hmm. really good for them. It's good for business. It's not really what we want or what they want. Mm -hmm. So I, so that's when the final seed kind of came together for me. Okay. How can I take what I've learned over these years and put it in a format that others can do? And that's really was the origin of aroma freedom technique was, was realizing, you know, putting it in this, and as you know, this 12 step process. Mm -hmm. And that kind of brings in the computer programmer of me all over again. Right. Oh my gosh. I'm just having that light bulb. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because really, I mean, ultimately, I mean, I mean, we're all kind of a blend, but I, I have a strong left brain side that likes mm-hmm. to see things in a logical format. And the process of writing that book kind of forced me to put things in a format. And when I wanted to teach it to others, it has to be in something that's teachable. I can't just say, just, you know, smell a bunch of oils. That, that isn't no. really the point. It's no. much more, much more uh, sophisticated than that. So, but I kind of set it up almost like a uh, computer program. You do this, 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 and this. And then depending on what happens, you either return to this line to do this. And those of you who've done programming will know just what I'm talking about. There are mm-hmm. go-to statements and if this, do that. Um, so that's really kind of where all the pieces come together. And and uh, so in a sense, what we're doing, to take it even a step further, is we are kind of deprogramming ourselves. Yes. Uh, that life programs us, you know, and I think mm-hmm. it might have been Jung who said that we spend the first 20 years of our lives being programmed and the rest mm-hmm. of our lives trying to deprogram. I know. It's so true. It's that's really what we're doing. So fascinating. You've never, I've never heard you coin it that way. And I've listened to a lot of teaching by you that we are actually deprogramming. Yeah what has been programmed into us for so, so long. That's so fascinating and how amazing. I never got that piece either of your computer programming training because the approach, the aroma freedom technique and the trauma memory resolution technique are both very methodical. And for my right brained centered personhood, (laughs) it is so stabilizing. It just gives such peace to the whole process for sure. I'm privy to the knowledge of how you started using and brought in the oil frankincense into an EMDR, but would you share that with my community? Because to me, I feel like that was kind of the moment where you, that, that beautiful prophetic footing, that woman, you know, I think it was a woman gave you, you know, Hey, you should make a tool. And then in that yeah. moment, that tool kind of came to life. If you would just share that. 
Well, it was it was really based on EMDR. You know, yeah. years ago I had I had studied EMDR and I used it off and on in you know with my clients through the years and had good results. It was mm -hmm. EMDR is light years ahead of what they had before EMDR, which was not much. So EMDR, you know, let it, it, it I and I give credit to Francine Shapiro, she really kind of put together this concept of gathering the thought, the feeling, the body, and the image. And then in she, her case you were using eye movements or bilateral stimulation to process. Mm -hmm. And th by this point, I'd been using oils for a long time and been looking for how can I get them? How can I, I know they're powerful, but I don't know how to use them with people. And it was mm -hmm. this moment of let's smell an oil instead of doing the eye movements. And what happened was amazing because it was so gentle and it was yes. so fast. And because EMDR it can be kind of grueling for those of you who've been through MDR. It, mm -hmm. it, it works, but it, sometimes it feels like a freight train hits you. Mm -hmm. and I think it's because you're processing uh, with, I don't know how to say it inefficiently. You're, you're mm -hmm. kind of like mixing everything around and scrambling the image, but you're doing it at a level that you don't need to be. And what the sense of smell does is it comes in, I'd, I'd say if it comes in from underneath, mm -hmm. which is true anatomically in the brain that, um, you know, physiologically, it's kind of coming in under all the other filters. So like all the other senses, sight and sound and touch and, um, taste. and taste. I can never say all five. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the reason I paused on taste is because taste is kind of so intermixed with smell that I, I mm -hmm. but anyways, all those other major senses, those are processed by the thalamus and then they go to the amygdala. So the thalamus kind of puts them all together decides what's important, sends it to the amygdala to see if it's dangerous or not. Sense of smell doesn't work that way. Sense of smell goes directly to the amygdala. It mm -hmm. bypasses the thalamus. And so it kind of, that's why I say it comes underneath and it can immediately calm this aroused, this, you know, hyper aroused state, which happens whenever you're in a trauma or you're remembering a trauma. So, right. so this person was you know, I had her kind of, I did the setup, like the MDR says, you're setting them up and you're feeling it and it's right there and then smelling the oil and just, it, it just dissolved and uh, very gently, there was no residue mm -hmm. and it felt complete. So I kind of do, so for many years, actually, I was doing that. I kind of called it, I was a one trick pony when it came to oils. Like I knew <laughs> I could dissolve traumatic memories. I didn't know what else I could do, but I could do that. But I didn't have a way of knowing which traumas to dissolve and when to dissolve them and how a trauma might relate to things in everyday life. And EMDR right. is the same way. They'll say, well, just, you know, make a list of all your traumas and start knocking them off. I didn't really find that to be, I don't know, it didn't seem relevant much of the time. You know, someone's going through whatever in their life and I'm like making them talk about some other trauma that may or may not be relevant. Right. Mm -hmm. right. You know, and so the big breakthrough with, with Aroma Freedom when I created it was, was really starting with the concept of what do you want? You know, mm. set a goal. What do you want? What's your intention? Let's yes. start there. Instead of starting with what happened to you, let's start with yes. where you want to go. Mm -hmm. And then um, um, start with where you want to go. And then we're going to clear if there's any traumas that are that mm -hmm. are blocking you, they're going to come up and we'll clear them as we need to. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of what um, uh, the way that process started. So I don't know if I answered your question. But you did. Was, and what I was going, what I, what I wanted to hear your response to was uh, so many times, at least in my experience, since I have been on my journey through the certification to become a practitioner of this modality, we don't know, like you list your traumas. Well, <laughs> you know, most of the traumas that I have been invited in to help with are subconsciously hidden. And you can't name what it is you keep tripping over or that you're stuck in your life with, you know, you, you can't name it. You are triggered, right, right? By yeah. a, some stimuli and you go, what the heck? Why am I having this fierce shutdown or reaction or, you know, why? I, my question is, why do I keep tripping over this thing? Well, they're subconscious. They're implicit. They're not something that we're conscious of. Absolutely. And that, and that's a really good distinction. I, I think I want to underline for your listeners as well as the difference between explicit memory and implicit memory mm -hmm. and Please explicit do. memory is, you know, as, 
as it sounds like, it's the stuff you remember and you know that you remember. Like you remember where you were, you know, last Sunday eating lunch. It's an explicit memory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Implicit memories are what you learned from what happened in life, but that may never be a focus of attention. So you may never have named it, named it. And the classic example of that um, uh, comes from um, neuroscience. There was um, a person who had a damage in a certain part of her brain where she lost explicit memory. She lost the ability to create explicit memories, Mm. but she didn't lose the ability to make implicit memories. So here's how it happened. So Uh, Every day, the doctor would come in to see her, and she had no memory of ever meeting him before. So she had this amnesia, you could say. So I am Dr. Jones. Hi, nice to meet you. They shake hands, and they talk for a while. Pleasant conversation. Next day, oh, who are you? I'm Dr. Jones. Pleasant to meet you. So one day, he did an experiment, and he put a a little buzzer in his hand. And uh, when he met her, he shook her hand and gave her a little shock, and she she, had a reaction. And uh, then they get on with the day. So the next day, he comes in. She doesn't know who she, who he is. Okay. He goes to reach out to shake her hand and she goes like this. Ah, she mm-hmm. recoils. And that is a perfect illustration of consciously. She did have no conscious memory of him, Mm-mm. but her body remembered and in her implicit memory, which really has to do with emotional memory, mm-hmm. especially the memory of safety and danger. Right. And there's a part of her that remembered, Oh, something bad might happen here, mm-hmm. even though she didn't cut. So but that's like that in our whole life. As you say, you know, we're going along trying to do things to find ourselves blocked. Why am I procrastinating on this? Why am I anxious about that? Why do I get depressed at this time? Not knowing why, well, implicitly, we do know why, but we don't know explicitly. So right. part of the trick here and where we use uh, aroma freedom, we do it by kind of tapping into that inner subconscious voice and following it back to these memories is mm-hmm. um, we're tracing it back to these memories that we wouldn't ever consciously have connected. But Mm -hmm. by doing so, when you clear the emotion from a memory that was, that was um, um, discovered that way, all of a sudden the implicit memory literally dissolves and Mm -hmm. you're free at that point. You're free to have a new experience. If you want to go do something, there's nothing in you that stops you from doing it. And that's the kind of freedom that um, Mm I'm really talk about with aroma freedom. Oh, it's a freedom. Like I've never tasted. It's just a freedom. Like I've never seen so many people taste, you know, even from a few hours ago, like I explained to you before I came on how today I had two clients who had massive, like this was breakthrough day. One was after two years. One was after two months, you know, some are deeper than others, but you just stay the course and you stay and steady and keep doing the efficient modality and the work. And it's just, it, it just, Downs me. I just I'm so humbled to be able to possess. Thank you. Thank you. you no, know, I, I thank you so much. Would you just explain for our community here in, in the way only you do it so well, the memory complex, like what are these four steps or four stages uh, in the, you just explained it in such an efficient way. I've tried to memorize it from beginning to end. So if you would just once again, inform us what this memory complex is and why it's so important. Sure. So memory complex. So it actually goes all the way back to Freud and uh, he talks about having a mother complex, a father complex. Uh, Jung talked about it as well. Um, And the way we talk about it is it's really that when you have an event that occurs in your life, especially when there's strong emotion surrounding it, So we'll just make up an example. Let's say you're walking down the street and someone accosts you and demands your wallet and roughs you up and leaves. Let's just say that. Okay. And you survive, obviously. And now it's years later and you're walking around at the street corner and, you know, you get to that same part of town. What starts happening? Your heart starts beating and, you know, Mm -hmm. a little faster and your palms get sweaty. And so you may or may not know that this is, but think of it like an iceberg. You're at the tip of an iceberg of this memory complex. So the memory complex consists of, we call these four parts. There's, there's the image of what happened. So let's say it's the mugger is attacking you. Okay. There's the Mm -hmm. feeling that you had. It's a feeling of terror. Let's say there's that, where do you feel it in your body? Your heart's racing. Okay. And what's the negative thought is, oh my God, he's going to kill me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those are these four things that are all happening at once. Yes. You're reacting with all levels of your being here. And 
And because it was frightening and uh, you didn't, you didn't know what, I mean, you survived, but you mm-hmm. uh, maybe you survived by, you know, holding back screaming, let's say, and yes. uh, right. So you kind of like tense, tense your body in some way. So there's mm-hmm. a physiological thing that occurs and um, you get on with your day and, and so on. But this memory, as long as it has not been processed um, mm-hmm. sufficiently, it remains as this kind of semi-autonomous complex, this, this little, like, uh, it's like this undissolved thing that's yeah. in your psyche and mm-hmm. you can stumble on it through, like I say, if you're in that part of town, you might stumble on it. Or let's say you, um, you know, you're watching TV or watching a movie and there's someone who's getting mugged and then you're having this reaction. So you're right. stumbling, you're touching upon it. So the question is, how do you actually dissolve that? Mm-hmm. And the way you do that is by activating it in all four components, because just talking about it might not be enough. It's helpful to talk about it. Absolutely. It can mm-hmm. be helpful. So you could go to therapy and you could talk about it and talk about it and talk about it and talk about it, but you may mm-hmm. or may not feel better. Now, some things you do feel better over time. You kind yes. of work it through. And so that there is benefit to that, but um, um, to really dissolve it efficiently with the way we do is you just pull everything up. You know what you're looking for. You're looking for those four pieces. And this is what I always teach the certification students, mm-hmm. you know, wherever you are in the session, what are your four pieces? What's the image? What's yep. the feeling? What's the body? What's the thought? You pull all those together. And then the magic comes in when all that is held in consciousness. And then you smell the essential oils. Okay. Because mm-hmm. what's happening there is because it's distressing. So your amygdala is activated and mm-hmm. you're, you're in a fight or flight process, you know, system. Um, Response. Or flight mm-hmm. response. Okay. And then um, the sense of smell, it's irresistible because it's a survival, mm. it's a survival sense. So it's by smelling a calming essential oil, it tells your brain, okay, wait a minute, this is safe. So now your brain has to do some, some gymnastics. Say, well, wait a minute, I'm picturing this memory and I'm feeling relaxed. Well, I guess maybe it's okay. I guess maybe I survived. I guess maybe it it, I don't have to be afraid in the future. And your body starts relaxing. And then the image itself sometimes will literally dissolve. You see that yeah. happen in sessions. It's, it's crazy. It's but crazy. the image might even just, dis- sometimes they even forget what they're even talking about. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, so mm-hmm. tell me about that mugger. Like, what? Oh, what, I don't mugger? Know, what mugger? Like, who cares? Like, whatever. I like, had that happen today. He was like, I don't even really remember what we started with. Uh huh. I was like, that's good. Yeah. Right. These, things, these things that we're carrying around with us for decades, sometimes like there's no decades. limit to how long people can be holding this. Wow. And then it just dissolves because it's no longer relevant because memory memories are formed. And you, we all can probably think of situations like this. What do we remember in life? We tend to remember the stuff that affects us. Yeah. We remember the stuff that had a strong emotional charge, good or bad. So yeah, you yes. had a happy birthday party. You're going to remember that you had a terrible birthday party. You're going to remember that. Mm-hmm. You had kind of a run of the mill, normal birthday party. You might not remember that one, right? So when we turn a memory from a highly charged negative event to one that you're like, oh, yeah, it happened, but whatever. It's part let's, of my story. Let's now talk it's just about part dinner. of my story. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. So when it gets to that level, you, you might even not remember it much anymore. So that's kind of how we're dissolving those memory complexes. How did you choose? Because um, I always describe it as strategically developed strategically um formulated you know how did you did you just go i'm just going to grab that oil and that oil and that oil and that oil and just mix them all up and i think that'll be fine there had to be more to it than that sure well you know as i said i we have been using oils for i mean now it's been 20 years so at the time it was probably 15 years we had been using oils um Mm -hmm. And, you know, we worked with Young Living Oils. um, And so we had met Gary Young many times and he had done some phenomenal teaching uh, with emotions. I mean, he had a cancer clinic and he would not treat people until they dealt with their emotions because he knew it was that important Mm -hmm. and that you couldn't get the physical healing without the emotional. So he created these blends for specific purposes. And he created some blends specifically for trauma, some blends specifically for anger, let's say, some blends specifically for connecting with your inner self and, you know, those gratitude, those sorts of things. So I had been one for sexual abuse, right? Traumatic sexual sexual abuse. abuse. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. So, so I had been connected with that for a long time and I was Mm -hmm. aware of those oils and had played with them. Now, my problem was that as a left brain person, I didn't know how to strategically apply them so much until I 
had this format, but so when I was creating the format, um, well, actually the whole story is he had, he has one blend called trauma life, yes, um, which is a fabulous blend. And I was, that's, so that's the oil that I would use when I was oh. developing trauma was trauma life made and it worked like a charm. Now, the trouble is that uh, when everyone else in the world discovered essential oils in 2000. 14 or something, there was this huge explosion of interest. And the reason I know is because everything went out of stock in Young Living because all of a sudden everybody was doing it. Yes. So Trauma Life was out of stock for like two years. Oh, no. And, and uh, because, it, because they're natural, you can't just go to the lab and make more of it. You got to grow all the plants. Some of the plants take a year to grow. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you got to wait a while. Yeah. So it's not so that, chemical, it's not synthetic. This is high quality. Exactly. therapeutic grade. And that's why I promote. And that's why I only use, and you only use the young living because you know, what goes into your, your brain is very important. That's right. Yeah. You could damage your brain otherwise. Yes. So, so basically, so it was actually, it was kind of, they say necessity is the mother inve- invention. Mm-hmm. Though. So a, I was creating this technique that I wanted everyone to be able to do B we didn't have trauma life. So I said, Hmm, what can we use? So at that time, there was a starter kit Young Living had, and I looked at the starter kit and I said to myself, okay, what in that starter kit is going to have the best effect on the limbic system? Mm. And there are three oils in that kit that kind of just jumped out at me, stress away, frankincense and lavender. And so I dug a little deeper and in the library and I said, okay, well, let me see, is there some research to back them up? And sure enough, I found research on each of those on this, on the frankincense uh, how it affects the ion channels in the brain and lavender. It actually affects the opioid receptors. And the part of stress away that I was aiming at was the vanilla oil, the vanilla yeah. in stress away. And that mm-hmm. also has, it, it's like, so there's three different mechanisms, all of which are calming. So I said, we can't go wrong. Let's combine all three. Love and then what course, a moment, what a moment. And then, and then it was really try it and see. So I would just right. use those. And of course it worked like a charm. So I it said, does. okay, I guess these are the three. So we'll just blend those together. So that became, we call the memory release blend. And then mm-hmm. um, have it right here, guys. There you go. <laughs> yep. And then the inner child we use. Um, I just find I'd also use that for years with people after they had processed some trauma, I would then have mm-hmm. them smell the inner child because after processing trauma, often people feel vulnerable. They feel, right. okay, yes, I'm, I feel relieved, but also a little tender. You can oh, say like, right. Yeah. So inner child just it feels very nurturing. So I said, well, let's, let's use that. And then, uh, and then the other oil release oil, the other, like the main three that, that I would My use, favorite. the release Gary Young created really specifically for anger. Uh, and he says, put it on your liver is how he taught us to use it. Put it on your liver, Chinese medicine, anger, mm-hmm. goes to the liver, but so this includes everything around anger, like irritation, rage, frustration, sure. resentment, all of Annoyance. those things. Right. So then over the years, so this kind of became, so those are the main oils that mm-hmm. I was using. And uh, the more I've worked over the, now it's been five years, we've been using this. And, and um, what I've noticed is that as a person is going through the process, the first blend, the memory release blend is just kind of a general all purpose calming agent. And so you yeah. could just use that if you want. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then I find yes. that especially when there are feelings of sadness that will emerge, you know, so they're kind of the spectrum of the sad emotions. So what are those, you know, sad, lonely, hopeless, helpless, sorrow, right. sorrow despair, right? So all of those kind of the inner child just seems to really mm-hmm. support processing those. And then there's kind of the, the activated emotions, the angry, frustrated, yeah. right? And so kind of by using those three and we'll just kind of rotate through them, it just, it just seems to cover everything. So that's why I use those. And there are a lot of scents that could work, you know, and I could just say, Oh, just use whatever sense you have. But there's a couple of problems with saying that one is, you know, as we referred to, you don't know what kind of oil people are going to have. If they just go to Walmart and grab an oil, most oh. likely it's synthetic, most likely yes. it has some toxins in it. And I'm not going to tell them to deeply inhale it. So partially it's the quality of the oil. And then partially it's, um, you want to have the, the types of blends that are going to do the things we want them to do. In fact, one time I was, um, I was doing a group session with people and these were all oilers. They all had oils already. And I just said, and often in a group of oils, I'll just say, we use whatever oils you have on you. Cause I know they have young living oils and, okay. you know, so, and often it will work, but this, this, it was like two people, they came up to me after they said, gosh, we just couldn't shift. I said, well, what oils were you using? And they're like, oh, we have like, 
brain power and cedar wood and wintergreen. And like all those are very sharp oils. Like mm -hmm. there's nothing nurturing about those oils. True. So I said, go back and redo it using when you go home and grab the oils that I tell you to use, you might have a different result. So although a lot of smells will shift it, you know, there, there are certain qualities, uh, mm -hmm. they have to be nurturing and, and calming in, in some different ways. So, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not an aromatherapist, really, mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you, you know, which chemical constituents go into which oils, that's not my gifting. Mm -hmm. So that's where I kind of rely on Gary Young, who right. was a master at that, you know, he already did all that work, I'm just taking some of the things mm -hmm. he did, and using it in a specific way. Yes, which is what I, I always love your humility and your honesty and your authenticity. It's what makes this so beautiful. And it always reminds me there's a beautiful story of George Washington Carver. And when um, he was um, trying to, they were having fallow fields, right? Their crops weren't producing. So he locked himself in his workshop for seven days and he prayed, he was a believer, you know, and he was just like, I got to figure this out. I got to figure out how to help the soil. And he just heard that whisper, like you just heard, well, I'll, I'll just pull this and pull that. And he's, and he heard, look at the peanut, just mm -hmm. look at the peanut. I want you to look at the peanut. So for seven days, he looked at the peanut and he came out with these amazing discoveries. So I always wonder what the world looked like when he opened the door mm -hmm. of his workshop. And that's what I see here. And it, it's young still, as you've, you've said, it's only on its fifth year of being in its active role of being utilized in therapy and coaching and uh, in, in aroma freedom. And so what, what do you see, Dr. Perkis? What are you, what are you envisioning? I mean, I want this so badly to be an acceptable modality for people to be able to get their hands on, but so many still are like, oh, it's woo woo. I've even had people say, oh, my husband thinks you're doing voodoo. And I'm like, I don't, I've been to Haiti. I know voodoo. I'm not doing voodoo. You know, it's like, don't stop. It's ridiculous. This is so incredibly efficient and effective and gentle and miraculous. So what do you see? Oh, Dr. Perkins, <laughs> you know, what is your vision for the future of, of AFT and TMRT and sure. what's on well, your heart here? Sure. I mean, well, first of all, you know, when I created it, one of the choices that I made, you know, was on my, that was on me to make is, am I going to only train professionals in this or am I going to yeah. train everyone in this? And that was so the different, like EMDR, for instance, was only trained mental health professionals. And it's right. very much still within the medical model. There's a diagnosis mm -hmm. and then there's a treatment program. And then there's everything like that versus let's say tapping or EFT. That's an example of a modality that, you know, Anybody. Gary Craig said, okay, let's just tap everywhere, release it to the world and let anyone do it. And so I looked at the two and I, from my experience, and because the oils have this, even though we were working sometimes with some intense traumas, the process is so gentle because they're smelling the oils, they're calming the amygdala the whole time. It just kind of, it gave it that level of safety. Nobody was having these bad reactions. They just weren't. Mm -hmm. So I felt it was safe for everyone to use. And um, I mean, I do say, of course, you, if you're, if you're mm -hmm. working with someone who has PTSD or severe diagnosis, you want to have a professional involved. Absolutely. Oh, for sure. But it's something that uh, really everyone can do and they can mm -hmm. use as a self healing modality in addition to people who choose to use it with others. So I really, first of all, want it to be something that people use every day in their own life. Yes. Uh, since the book came out, of course, there have been some, uh, we've developed some some kind of spin-off techniques that are yes. even more simple, like the aroma reset, you know, is. Yes, is tell us just a real quick thing about that. I have yeah. a, I know, have another whole podcast dedicated to it, but go ahead. <laughs> sure, well, the reset actually, it actually came from our friend Teresa, who um, we were, uh, uh, she was a uh, practitioner and, and she was excited about AFT and she wanted to introduce it at uh, at a women's conference, I think it was. And she said, but I, I don't have time to take everyone at the booth through a whole AFT session. So she said, well, so should I, um, should I just have people think about something that's bothering them and the smell and oil? And I said, wait a minute, because <laughs> I remembered the memory complex has these four components. So make people aware of those components first. So first picture the situation, name the feeling, which is critical, find it in your body. What is the negative thought that goes with it? Then smell the oil. So she said, she came back the next week. She said, you're not going to believe this. She said, 
I had four and five ladies at a time. And I was just taking them through resets and they were crying and they were booking sessions with me and they were ordering oils and they couldn't get enough of this. So I, so I tried it. And I taught a little bit. I said, what is this called? And I realized my best sense of it is it's like a reset. It's like bringing yeah. you from whatever that overwhelm, that frustration or shock, whatever it is, resetting you, bringing you back to the present moment, using the same principles that I had used with Aroma Freedom of the memory complex, but realized it's actually something that's happening all the time. We're continually yes. generating feelings and thoughts mm-hmm. about everything that's happening. So by using this simple reset process, you can just kind of restore yourself to stability. A quick example of this, uh, one time my wife, uh, we were uh, doing something and um, uh, we'd, I noticed the cat was on the bed and the cat was gonna like cough up a fur ball. It's like, I didn't want the cat to cough the fur ball up on the comforter. So I reached over and I kind of aggressively, I guess she felt it was aggressive. I grabbed the cat and I put it on the ground and, and then it coughed up its fur ball on the ground and we cleaned it up. So yes. I felt like I did a great thing. I saved the comforter, <laughs> right? Okay. And then I noticed like half an hour later, like she's, my wife was just really, she, she was agitated. Agitated. And she, edge and she was just wound up and she was, I said, what's going on? And she said, well, she said, well, when you grabbed the cat, I thought you were going to hurt the cat. Oh. I didn't know that. It wasn't my intention to hurt the cat and I didn't mm-hmm. hurt the cat, but it doesn't matter what my intention was. Mm-hmm. That's what she experienced. And she was still stuck there. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, let's do a reset on this. So I said, okay, so picture that moment when you saw me reaching towards the cat. So she pictured it and named the feeling and she felt whatever fear, whatever it was, find it in your body. What's the negative thought? Breathe the oils. Took all of a minute. And she just right. comes down. She was able to let it go, realize everything's fine. Cat's fine. Husband's fine. She's fine. And we got on with our day. And imagine if we hadn't done that. Yeah. For all we know, we could have gotten into a fight or we could have, oh, yeah. you know, this is how these things happen. Fights mm-hmm. over nothing, right? It's because it's usually that is what it is. Yeah. And people come back and go, why did this happen over a Nerf ball in the garage? Exactly. You know, I'm like, well, cause you know, there's all this undercurrents, all these all underlying. Yes. For yeah. sure. So, and that's so where this, I see it most useful, actually. I'm exactly. like, keep it close, so, keep it close, keep a bottle, keep a little mm-hmm. bottle close, one in your car, one in your pocket, you know? Exactly. So when you can, so I would love that. I would love to get to the point where everybody in this country or in the <sighs> world has the ability to on the fly realize mm-hmm. that they can do something about their emotional state they're in and mm-hmm. they can use that reset, clear that out, and then as needed, go deeper. So I, I just came up with this analogy today in class, actually, that <laughs> you remember reset is like mowing the grass. Okay. The grass is going to, you mow the grass. So it gets back to normal. You can go and get on with your life. Okay. But sometimes you got to dig out the weeds. That's Ugh. when you're going to need the deeper processes. That's when you need the TMRT, yeah. the AFT to go back and clear those traumas. Okay. Mm-hmm. But minimally starting with the present to be able to kind of recapture yourself and not Mm-hmm. not get in these states that, that, uh, shut you down. So right. I guess That's... my vision of it is very much, uh, something I want to be universal. I want people to be using. So how is that going to get into popular consciousness? You know, maybe it's the first time a celebrity uses it on TV, who knows, you know, there's, right. uh, you never know how these things happen. And, and all right. of a sudden something goes from being unacceptable, like probably the peanut was at one point, not considered mm-hmm. at all. Right. And then something yeah. happens and all of a sudden everybody wants peanut butter. So it wasn't a crop. It wasn't, you know, it was very, and, and, and everything did come from that. I can, I have a list this long, you know, of the, the things that came from peanuts, uh-huh. you know, look at the yeah. peanut and you were like, look at the oils, let's look at this and let's combine yeah. it. So my prayer is that it will be what I love. And after I was done with my certification practitioner training, I walked away astounded, of course, breathless, but I walked away going healing does not have to be complicated. It has been my one mantra, my one phrase. It does not have to take on the average therapy is 12 years. Wow. Average. Oh my gosh. I hate that. I hate it. I want to obliterate it. Yep. You know, and, and as a, um, mental health professional, when this was added into my toolbox, it changed the trajectory of my own practice. So I want to speak to all you heart lifters out there who have your own practice or who are in the mental health professional training to get the certification. I'm going to give you all of the information on how to do that. 
because to have this tool in your toolbox is a game changer. It's efficient and effective. And I I just can't, I can't say it enough. I don't want to hold you much, but I do want you, Dr. Perkis, to share um, your new found fear to freedom. It's not out there yet, but give us the first dib so that we can be looking out for it. Sure. So, um, yeah, I'm always looking to see, you know, how can how can what I'm doing be relevant to what's happening in society today and with people today? And, uh, you know, fear is one of the biggest things that uh, is just so pervasive in society right now. And so many people's Mm -hmm. lives, fear of all kinds of things, fear of illness, fear of loss, um, on and on. So many fears. Yeah. And so. uh, you know, with, with all emotions, in a sense, because my, my technique is so simple, sometimes it feels strange to be going on and on about, you know, I all know. the music. It's, it's so simple, but okay. So, simple. So, so when someone's afraid of something, what does that mean? First of all, they're disempowered. Okay. They feel like they can't, they can't do it. They have to run away. They have to hide. They have to freeze. They have to Shrink. get small. They have to. Now, the other thing that it often means is they look for someone else to save them. They look for they look yes. for a way out. They look for that person in the white coat or that person in the suit and tie or that person in the of authority. And like, okay, I'll do what you say as long as you can protect me. And it's like a herd mentality, you know. Okay, well, I better you know huddle close to the herd and do what everyone else is doing in order to survive. So when we're in fear, we are more vulnerable to being controlled, more vulnerable to mm-hmm. no longer being reasonable about things, mm-hmm. and. Um, well, we're, we are disempowered in our own capacity to think. Yeah, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. So it makes me question my thinking. Yeah. I mean, there's this saying that says when emotion goes up, intelligence goes down and there's mm-hmm. something to that. So we're in this highly aroused state. We're not thinking, we're only reacting and responding. So, so just as a simple ex- example of using, let's say the reset with fear. So you're afraid of something. The first step is to name the fear. So what is it you're actually afraid of, which sometimes people don't even, they haven't even named it. They're like, uh, everything, I don't know, but you really kind of stay with it. Well, what is it really? Is it getting sick? Is it someone dying? Is it a respirator? Whatever it, <laughs> whatever it is. So, yes. okay. And then, okay. And where do you feel that fear in your body? So make people leave their bodies. Okay. So get them back in their body. I feel it. My heart is tightening. I feel in the pit of my stomach. Okay. What's the negative thought that goes with that fear? Oh, he's going to die or she's going to die or I'm going to die or whatever Mm -hmm. it is. Okay. Now breathe the oils into that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And breathe the oils into whatever it is you're picturing. As they do that, things start to relax. Things start to calm down. Okay. All of a sudden you're like, wait a minute. Okay. I'm actually feeling okay here. And that thing that I'm fearing the image start, what was I afraid of again? I don't even remember, you know? Mm -hmm. So it could might dissolve the fear. Um, The other thing that can happen is, it's not that the possibility of the feared thing is gone, because as we know, mm-hmm. anything's possible. You still could get mm-hmm. sick. You still could die. You still could whatever. But you're able to think again, and you're able to feel again, and you can approach it from a fresh perspective. And Correct. you'll listen, and you'll hear that inner guidance, which we all have. We mm-hmm. don't all use it, but we all have this, this potential, this voice of intuition, of guidance, mm-hmm. uh, to be our guidance, however you want to say it, that is able to come in and say, uh, you're going to be okay. It's, it's yeah. going to be okay. And, yeah. and then we can move on. So then we're free. Then we're free to yeah. actually make a choice. Well, what am I going right. to do to, to protect myself? But I'll give you an example of this. I Please was, do. Uh, I love it. Um, it's actually similar to a technique I created called the aroma wisdom technique, which is really where your, uh, your, your starting point is worry. Something that you're worried about is going to happen. One of my students was uh, shared this story with me as I was taking everyone through the process. So I said, I started off by saying, we'll start with something that you're worried about. Mm-hmm. And so she told me later that she was picture, she was really worried that her kids were going to drown because they had a mm-hmm. pool and she was just always tense whenever they were in the pool and she just mm-hmm. driving her crazy. And so she took herself, well, she, I was taking everyone through the process and uh, she was able to, as she named it and feeling and the body and smelled it, And as her anxiety level came down, her guidance came in. It says, get them swimming lessons. So simple. So simple. So simple. And as soon as she had that thought, she calmed down. She realized that get us empowered. They learn how to swim. Then it goes from this disempowered, 
I'm you know, at the mercy of this random, terrible thing that could happen to, actually, there's something I can do which will minimize the chance that this will happen. So mm-hmm. she was so much more relieved just by having that little piece of that little nugget of wisdom that she didn't have access to when mm-hmm. she was so busy being worried, she couldn't think straight to think of getting them swimming lessons. That's so powerful. And I've had so many of those experiences. Yeah. You're like, duh. <laughs> like, yeah. uh-huh. However you want to say it, it's like the light bulb goes off. It's that uh, uh, yeah. you, you calm down. Is it safe to say your amygdala calms down? You know, you get back into that parasympathetic nervous system and you just come into that prefrontal where you can reason. Exactly. Where you can think it through, yep. where you can receive, where you can receive the wisdom. And so I think you've led me on a journey. I'm going to create a, a follow-up bonus and guide um, you guys, you heart lifters out there through an aroma wisdom. So that'll be fun. Uh, that'll be a challenge for me because I've not done that modality yet. So I will do that. But I wonder if in closing, I've kept you way too long but I am so grateful if you would just lead us in a short heart centering here at the end, we probably should have done it at the beginning, but I love your heart centering. And if I could capture that, that would just be a real gift to sure. so many. Sure. Be happy to. Okay. Everyone out there. So go ahead and make sure you're not driving or operating heavy machinery and uh, just take yes. a moment and close your eyes and just start slowing your breathing down. Right. So to do this is to count your breath. Breathe in to the count of five and out to the count of five. And just do a few cycles of that into the count of five and out to the count of five. And keep going with this rhythm. And as you slow your breathing down, that gives your brain the message that it's safe to relax. And so you notice your body relaxing. Bring your awareness down to your heart. Maybe put your hand on your heart, center of your chest or on your physical heart. And just notice what you feel under your hand, the quality you feel in your heart. Does it feel soft? Does it feel hard? Feel tense, relaxed? Take a moment now and Pay attention to something you're grateful for. Think of something you feel grateful for, a person or a thing or a situation. As you feel that gratitude, gratitude is one of these specific emotions that has the quality of opening the heart. Notice what happens to your heart. Does it feel softer? Does it feel more relaxed, squishier. It's just a simple way of coming into your heart. And then from this place of heart center, you can go anywhere from here. Often a good place to go, say if it's the beginning of a session, is you can take a moment and visualize what you would love to see happen in your life. And just imagine that and take some time to imagine that in detail. Maybe what you want to see happen in your career, or your love life, or your family life, or your health. By doing this heart centering first, you're going to be coming from a place where it's really going to be relevant for you, not just some idea that someone planted in your head, but really your heart has wisdom and knows what's best for you at this time in your life. So as you visualize that, get clear on that. Go ahead and book a session with Janelle and she'll help you get there. <laughs> <laughs> or, do, or Dr. Yeah, Perkis, who's now back on the me. books. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm so grateful. So grateful yeah. that you've opened up your books and you're taking clients as well. And so I'm going to let everybody in the uh, community know how to get a hold of you and how to access. You're on my site, uh, JanelleRoon.com slash um, Room freedom. And so I'll just have all that for everyone to get to know. But thank you, Dr. Perkers, from the bottom of my heart. I am so grateful to you. And I just pray that you continue thriving and continue locking yourself up into your workshop <laughs> and looking for ways to help us all access true joy and true freedom. Thank you. Well, my pleasure. My pleasure. So great to see you again. Have a great day. You too. 
Thanks for listening today. It was great having you here. For even more great content and resources, please join the Stronger Every Day online community at JanelleRairdon.com. Always remember, you, my friend, have value, worth, and dignity.